Thank you, Tom. Um, the court will hear two federal sentencing cases on Tuesday, the second day of the term. Uh, and they address related issues about how much discretion federal trial court judges now have in this new era in which the federal sentencing guidelines have been held to be advisory in the federal judiciary rather than mandatory. This court is still trying to clear up the rubble left by the earthquake of its opinion uh, in the Booker case in 2005 when the court first struck down the federal sentencing guidelines, which had ruled sentencing in federal criminal cases for 25 years uh, and held that uh, because they violated the Sixth Amendment right to have juries decide all facts that determined uh, sentences, uh, that the judicial fact-finding that occurred during the guidelines uh, uh, determination process um, couldn't require that uh, certain kinds of punishments be imposed. Now, the court could have just said, and, and there were justices on the court who wanted the court to say exactly this, that the answer would be to force juries to make those factual determinations, keep, the, keep guidelines, but have the juries do the fact-finding. Um, probably due to the uh, influence of Justice Stephen Breyer, who had been one of the original members of the Sentencing Commission that created the guidelines, the court wanted to keep more of the initial guidelines structure in place, which had all the fact-finding uh, in judges' hands. And the court held that judges still could continue to find facts during sentencing hearings and use the guidelines as written as long as uh, the guidelines were held to be advisory on the federal judiciary rather than mandatory. And uh, under the mandatory federal sentencing guidelines, the appellate courts played a huge role that they had not played before and that they don't play in state sentencing decisions where they would review what the trial courts did to see if they did their guidelines math correctly. And the court in rendering the guidelines advisory in Booker told the federal courts of appeals, you are now to review what the trial courts do in their sentencing uh, under a reasonableness review standard. Well, everyone knew we were coming back to the court because the court was going to have to say what reasonableness review entailed. And there's been a lot of confusion and disagreement in the circuit courts about what reasonableness review entails. Now, we have a good hint as to where the court is going with this because last term the court decided an important case in the reasonableness review question mark category, the uh, Rita versus United States, in which the, the court approved uh, a circuit court's determination that it could treat sentences that were within the guidelines range as presumptively reasonable because, um, said Justice Breyer, um, uh, the guidelines reflect you know, a lot of thought and care by very smart people, and therefore if a judge says uh, uh, this, this sentence uh, falls within the guidelines range and I think it's a good sentence, the judge doesn't, it, it's a little bit unclear in Rita how much more the judge has to say other than it was the guideline sentence and that's what I'm giving, but a court, an appellate court can presume that the sentence is reasonable. But the, the court was very clear to say a couple of things. One is that trial courts can't presume that they must start with the guideline sentence because the statute um, that remains to guide federal judges in their sentencing gives them a list of things they must do, um, things they must consider. They must try to make a sentence that's not more than necessary under the circumstances, the circumstances including facts about the offense and the offender and the guidelines range and the need to promote uniformity. So the guidelines range is only one element that a trial judge must consider. So trial judges cannot say, I must start with a presumption that the guidelines um, range is reasonable, although an appellate court can have that presumption. So you, I mean, the rule one or for many, many trial court judges is don't get reversed. So if you know that the appellate court's rule is if you sentence within the guidelines, that's presumptively reasonable, it's hard to see how that not, is not going to translate to some extent to trial courts thinking, well, I'm in safe territory if I sentence within the guidelines range. But there's not 
tremendous fear of that happening because the federal judiciary, left, right, and center, have hated the federal guidelines and have uniformly, left, right, and center, considered them too harsh, uh, especially in, um, in drug cases. So that you have judges like Judge Paul Cassell, who would be very comfortable over at the Federalist Society and is often there, um, writing impassioned um, uh, decisions from the bench decrying the sentences that he's been required to impose uh, under the guidelines and under mandatory minimums. So the question that remains, of course, post Rita is when a federal judge doesn't give a guideline sentence but gives a sentence that is not what the guidelines would call uh, upon that judge to do, what's the appellate court supposed to do in deciding whether it's reasonable for the judge to do that? So the two cases on Tuesday involve two different aspects of this reasonableness review of sentences that depart from the guidelines. Um, one is, what if a judge departs from the guidelines because he thinks the guidelines are just wrong? They're just stupid. And this is the 100 to 1 crack powder cocaine distinction, um, where a judge here in Virginia um, was sentencing uh, a uh, a guy who actually had both crack and powder and a gun, so he was in bad shape. And he, um, and he pled guilty, uh, exposing him to mandatory minimums. He was facing a 10-year mandatory minimum on the crack. Nothing the judge could do about that. A 10-year, I mean, a five-year mandatory minimum consecutive on the gun. So 15 years. That, that was the very least that the judge could sentence him to. The the guidelines range because. Of it, driven by the fact that some of the drugs were crack as opposed to powder, the guidelines range, instead of being 15 years, would have been 19 to 22 years. And the judge said, looking at the statute, I think that the sentence that I can impose that's not more than necessary is 15, the bottom that the judge could do with the mandatory minimums. And he said, and I'm giving a bunch of reasons, some of which had to do with the defendant. He was he had only misdemeanors in his record. He was um, gainfully employed. He had been a veteran in Desert Storm. The judge said there are reasons to think for this defendant, 15 years is enough. And the judge also said, and this crack powder thing, this is nuts. This is just crazy. And even the Federal Sentencing Commission had been writing reports for years saying, we've got to change this. We were nuts. Let us change this in Congress. And a quite unusual move said, no, you can't change it to make it exactly the same as powder. Go try to do something else with that. Um, and the, the judge here in, in Virginia is not alone. Other circuit courts, including the Third Circuit and the D.C. Circuit, have approved um, judges departing from the guidelines precisely because they thought the crack powder differential was a bad idea. But the Fourth Circuit, which reviewed the Virginia judge's determination in this case, the Kimbrough case, has a, a different rule that says it is per se unreasonable to depart from what the guidelines, it's not really a depart, to deviate, because depart is a word from under the old mandatory view, but to give a sentence different from what the guidelines would call for uh, if you're basing it on the crack powder uh, differential, if you're disagreeing with that policy, because the Fourth Circuit said that policy is written into the differential mandatory minimums, it is Congress's will that there be that differential, and therefore the ju judges may not ever um, give that as a reason for uh, departing, for giving a different sentence from uh, what would be called for under the guidelines. So one question is, can you just disagree with the guidelines?